Welcome to Three Questions. I'm Tariana Stewart, and I'm an AI licensing executive here at IBM Research. I'm here with Pen Yu Chen, who just had eight papers accepted in Neurops. Thank you, welcome. Congratulations on having eight papers accepted into this conference. So the topic of your papers is on adversarial robustness. And uh, in layman's term, this basically means we are hacking proofing AI and different machine learning systems, right? Yes, definitely. So I guess you can say that we are living in a world essentially to where AI is touching every single aspect of our lives, right? And so we have a lot of industries that are trying to incorporate AI into their products, but they may not necessarily understand the negative impacts that these systems or these AI systems can have in their products. If it's not in their business plan to have certain testing done like mm -hmm. um, robustness, because uh, your AI system might be accurate, right? But it does not necessarily mean that it is robust. Accuracy does not necessarily equal robustness, which is where your research comes into play. So. Let's talk about your papers. Why don't you just describe adversarial robustness in your own words? Yeah, yeah. thanks, uh, Tariana, for the nice introduction. Yeah, so my research focuses on adversarial machine learning, and our goal uh, is really to bridge the gap between uh, machine learning development versus the deployment. Um, let me make a, an analogy here. So, uh, so like, a, a, like creating our AI technology is pretty much like a growing a, a plant. Mm -hmm. And we usually, when we are doing development, we grow our plants in an ideal environment, like a greenhouse. So we assume that, uh, assume the conditions are nice and everything uh, is friendly to the machine learning uh, algorithm. So, uh, but when we are about to deploy that machine learning system in the real world, right, it will be facing a lot of uh, uh, um, uh, issues or troubles, right, a like different environment. So how can we bridge the gap and ensure uh, the machine learning we develop uh, in the uh, greenhouse mm -hmm. can be safely deployed and survive in the real world? Right. Uh, uh, and, and when we're talking about survive, there are really two scenarios that we look at. Um, in the adversarial setting where we actually assume there will be an actual uh, adversary out there, like a, a, a malicious hacker that mm -hmm. tried to um, uh, sabotage the, the performance of our machine learning system and uh, try to break in our system and gain their leverage. So that's in the adversarial setting. Uh, and also, uh, not, not just for the adversarial setting, but in the natural setting, we al also want to make sure our uh, system is robust to like natural corruptions, uh, like uh, image corruptions, like uh, um, um, incomplete information and so on. We still want to make sure our machine learning system can make robust and correct decision uh, against the different uh, scenarios. So that's the, the whole picture and the reason why we are introducing um, adversarial machine learning uh, in the world. And the adversarial machine learning is the way we are using to achieve adversarial robustness of our machine learning system. So what was your contribution to the field of adversarial robustness through the eight papers that have, were submitted through NeurIPS? Yeah, so a uh, very important thing we uh, did for the past years is to lo really look at uh, uh, the vulnerabilities uh, when we develop our machine learning systems. And uh, speaking of developing machine learning systems, uh, we can develop uh, the machine learning uh, life cycle into two phases. Um, so there is a, a phase we call training phase, uh, where you will collect data and decide which machine learning model you will use to train on those data. Uh, and there is also a testing phase where uh, the models, are, when the models are fully trained and tuned, uh, you will deploy that model uh, either through a, a white box uh, a setting that the, every, the, where you put everything transparent to the user, like releasing the model details, the weights, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, everything. And, or you can also deploy your model in a black box setting, like through an API where the users can access, uh, but they uh, did not know what is the, the theme or the details behind that model. So looking at this life cycle of this machine learning uh, systems development, uh, there are a lot of uh, places where the hackers can come in and try to compromise our systems. So uh, a lot of the things we do in our adversarial robustness research is to, to uh, actively identify those uh, potential risks mm -hmm. when we are developing this uh, machine learning system. So for example, in the training phase, if we assume the attacker has the ability to uh, inject some malicious data, uh, into our training uh, uh, data, then uh, it will be a, a called a backdoor attacks or training training phase attack. Uh, then, and once they inject those backdoors, uh, they can manipulate whatever uh, machine learning models train on those poison data. And you can imagine the, uh, how dam uh, how damaged it will be, right? To to be ha having ability to um, uh, affect or control to to some extent the machine learning system we are de uh, deploying.
So uh, when we look at this life cycle of uh, these AI systems, we, what we are trying to do is to identify those bugs or those potential risks mm -hmm. uh, that can potentially exist in uh, the machine learning uh, um, development and deployment pipeline. And after uh, 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 discovering those risks, we will propose uh, mitigation strategies, including uh, detecting those uh, threats uh, and, um, um, and also um, strengthening our machine learning systems to be robust against those adversarial attacks. Uh, and there is also another line of work that we do, uh, it's called the certification, which is basically provides a level of robustness uh, of the systems where we are using. And it's very important because those uh, proofs uh, can be used uh, um, to, uh, uh, for AI regulation mm -hmm. to meet the requirements of uh, future AI technology and so on. So that's pretty much the, the scope that we do to uh, make sure our uh, AI system uh, can achieve uh, what we call holistic adversarial robustness in this scenario. Well, you just describe different types of attacks. Do you mind elaborating on that and maybe talk about like real world um, examples that where this might happen? Yeah, so uh, we have seen a lot of uh, um, real world examples, uh, kind of the potential negative impacts brought by lacking robustness of our machine learning system. So uh, one typical example we often highlighted is the uh, the, the autonomous driving scenario. So in this case, uh, we are using uh, AI technology to help us recognize or even um, uh, drive our cars. Uh, so it's very important they, they will not, uh, for example, misidentify a passenger uh, uh, going through or uh, misidentify a, a stop sign as, uh, as something else, right? right? So, but uh, in, in many research, including ours, we actually show uh, such, uh, uh, what we call adversarial examples, this, um, uh, similar examples but carefully designed objects that to, to, to deceive the, the, uh, the, the perception and decision of the machine learning system is actually possible, right? So for example, uh, you can simply add some stickers, right, uh, to the stop sign mm -hmm. and then suddenly, all of a sudden, um, you will become a blind spot to the uh, autonomous driving system and it will recognize as something else, like a speed limit. Okay. So, the, so the car wouldn't stop at the place that it is supposed to stop. Uh, and in, also in our research, we also um, de uh, uh, designed something uh, uh, like we call a, a physical adversarial T-shirt. So it's again some uh, specially designed uh, pattern. So whoever is it T-shirt, yeah, it's, oh, it's a physical T-shirt. Oh, okay, yeah, so okay. we we design this pattern and we print it in, on our T-shirt. So whoever is wearing that T-shirt can evade the detection of a personal detector. Oh, so okay. you can imagine there are a lot of uh, imp implications uh, in terms of a safety related applications. Maybe like in large AI. crowd or something like exactly, that. You may exactly. want to, I guess, distract the system from like facial recognition. Yes. They might have something on their T-shirts, yes, right? Yes, okay. yes, yes. So, so in a scenario, especially like a, a death and life matter mm -hmm. scenario or in scenarios that is of really high risks, but we are using AI to help us making decisions or helping us to uh, make observations, we have to make sure they are robust and safe to use. Okay. So what is federated learning, right? Because that's a topic too that you have um, that's part of your papers. And how is that applied to AI? Yes. Yeah. So federated learning is uh, um, nowadays a very popular uh, emerging machine learning technology. So the idea is uh, different entities here, we call workers here, actually uh, hold uh, a set of uh, private data. Uh, like for example, uh, hospitals, they have uh, um, information about uh, the, uh, the patients and also um, financial institutes like banks, they have the, uh, some information about the customers. And all different uh, banks or hospitals, they want to jointly use uh, this data in a private way to train a better machine learning model, let's say a long uh, application uh, model or um, some um, healthcare related uh, machine learning products uh, by collect collectively using the data uh, uh, in, in, a, in a private manner. So the idea of the federated learning is, uh, is there any, any way we can build such a machine learning system that will share data uh, indirectly uh, uh, without violating the privacy uh, issues. Right. Um, so the idea of the federated learning is uh, they each uh, client will share something called gradients, which is some aggregated information about the, uh, some loss functions we design for the private data. So by sharing those uh, gradients, each client will eventually uh, obtain a federated learning model, right? That will have a better performance by aggregating all this uh, higher level information about the private data. Uh, but what we discovered uh, in uh, one of our papers uh, is uh, there is actually a way to leak this uh, private information. Uh, that was going to be my while, next question, yes. what happens when all this data leaks? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So why this is imp very important is because uh, when we are developing this federated learning system, we are supposed to 
uh, protect privacy and not leaking any information. So, but without uh, careful thinking or without caution, uh, we may think right by sharing gradients, it, because we are not directly sharing data, it should be private or secure to use. Uh, but what we discover is that in this uh, vertical federated learning setting, uh, this uh, data can actually be leaked while you are training these uh, federated learning algorithms. Uh, and so after discovering this, uh, uh, we call it a large scale data leakage issue, catastrophic data leakage issue. Uh, we also propose some uh, mitigation strategies by uh, designing a more secure uh, gradient sharing mechanisms to, to prevent uh, this leakage from happening. So let's talk about another paper that's been accepted on the topic of contrastive learning, right? Explain what that is, and again, how is that important to AI? Yeah, so um, contrastive learning is uh, also a widely adopted technology, and the goal is to really learn uh, general representations of our data uh, in an unsupervised manner. So unsupervised here means we are not really using any labels uh, to, 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 to learn such a representation. So it's very uh, different uh, in contrast to a standard machine learning setting where we are, for every task, we will uh, annotate some labels and uh, train a machine learning mm -hmm. model just to solve that particular right. task. But recently, there's a new trend of uh, uh, training a large-scale pre-trained uh, model for general purpose, right? And we see a lot of success in this field, like GPT-3, uh, like large-scale language models or large-scale uh, image re uh, recognition models. So they learn uh, general representations of either text or uh, images. And with these uh, powerful uh, pre-trained models, uh, you can uh, use that model to fine-tune to different tasks and, and achieve state-of-the-art performance. What do you mean by fine-tuning? What do you so, mean by that? Yeah, so fine-tuning means uh, so we, we first use this uh, large uh, pre-trained model, for example, uh, data that we mm. can collect it from all the image database or data we can collect it from all the Wikipedia texts, and then we train a model to represent those uh, objects like text or images uh, of our interest. And when we and, and then we are going to take that representation, learn from that model to uh, fine tune to a specific task we are going to solve. Uh, for example, in image domains, uh, the tasks could be uh, image classification mm -hmm. or object detection or um, you know uh, region question answering. And for text domains, uh, it can be uh, like a, a fine tune a large language model to do question answering, uh, natural language understanding, uh, sentiment classification, and so on. Wait, hold on. The analogy of like cracking the different tasks. Yes. Like, what do you mean by that? Just elaborate a little bit more. Yeah, so, yeah. so the, I would say the big hammer is really the, 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 the foundation models that, okay. we, that we train in a, in a very cost, uh, in a cost, costly manner because we need a large model and also collect a sufficiently large amount of data to make that uh, representation, gen to learn that general representation. But once we spend that cost and uh, ha having that nice general representations, these, these general representations can really represent the relations or semantic meanings of the objects we care about. And it can be uh, efficiently fine-tuned to downstream tasks. Okay. Um, that, that's, and that's why I, I mentioned it's a big hammer and this downstream task that can be like, cracked uh, easily uh, uh, once we have that hammer ready. Um, so, uh, but if we, you start look at this uh, problem from uh, uh, um, robustness angle, right? Seems 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 uh, uh, are not so trivial, right? So when we are doing uh, this fine tuning step from uh, uh, this uh, pre-trained foundational model to a specific task, mm -hmm. uh, we should not only care about accuracy, right? We should also care about other uh, trustworthy fa um, uh, factors, especially robustness. Um, and again, to our surprise, right? There is really no free lunch, right? When you are thinking about robustness, right? So when uh, although this uh, uh, contrastive learning idea or this pre-training fine-tuning idea uh, seems to work when to preserve accuracy and achieve state-of-the-art performance in several downstream tasks, when we look at the, 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 the robustness of those downstream tasks, uh, they, 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 it's, pretty, it's pretty much nothing, right? So they can only preserve accuracy but not be able to preserve robustness, uh, which means when you deploy, again, you, you deploy this machine learning system in the real world, uh, it may not uh, behave as ideal as we want. Right. Um, so that, that's why we, uh, in the other paper that we, uh, we work on, we uh, uh, propose new ways uh, to train such uh, foundational models, a new, new way of doing uh, adversary robust uh, contrastive learning to ensure uh, when you uh, use our model to do fine tuning on a new uh, downstream task, uh, the robustness mm -hmm. and the accuracy can be uh, jointly preserved. So where do you see this technology going in the future, mm -hmm. how do you see this being accessible to industries, like you're saying hospitals or mm -hmm. banks, sure. or um, maybe even the average Joe at home? 
Yeah, definitely. I'm very happy you, you brought this up. Yeah. So there are two pers perspectives I want to answer this question. Right? There's education perspective and there's also research mm -hmm. perspective. Uh, so in the education perspective, I, I really want to uh, convince people there is really a confirmation bias in terms of using accuracy mm -hmm. uh, as the only metric to benchmark the success of our machine learning model. Okay. Right? And I think there's a good reason they we have been using accuracy for so long because there was a time where you know, AI's performance is just the way below a human's performance. And in that uh, period, we are really focusing on boosting the accuracy. Right. But I believe now we are at the stage where we believe AI technology is mature in some sense and ready to, to uh, um, deploy and uh, even um, help industrial revolution. So in that case, we should really look at the different factors that are essential to make sure AIs can be uh, safely and reliably uh, being deployed. Uh, like trustworthy factors like fairness, explainability, mm -hmm. and robustness, yes, yes. right? So in the education level, we really try to make sure uh, people understand and will acknowledge the uh, the danger of using accuracy as the only metric mm -hmm. to um, uh, benchmark the performance of the AI system. Okay. And we are offering a lot of tools uh, to help them inspect the different uh, trustworthy dimensions uh, of the AI system. Tools and certifications? I exactly. Okay. Uh, and a lot of tools are have been uh, offered uh, for uh, robustness, have been offered in Adversal Robustness Toolkit, which is the open source library. And that's part of the, our education purpose. Okay. Uh, and for research purpose, uh, I, I have this uh, long term vision uh, to build a, a system that I call AI Model Inspector. Okay. So it's something that I, I, I'm very excited about is really to use AI to improve AI. So, so the idea is really to uh, make sure uh, we have an AI system that keeps monitoring the status uh, of, of the AI service or product okay. we, are, we are deploying. And that includes you know, uh, inspecting uh, if there is, is uh, any errors or threats that could happen mm -hmm. in the current state of the system. And once those the threats or um, risks has, has been uh, uh, flagged, how can we mitigate such a threat and okay. make sure the machine learning system can operate in a safe and a robust uh, manner? And also along the way, we also need, need to make sure we can uh, we are able to certify the robot the level of robustness of right. our uh, AI systems, especially for these high stakes uh, applications. Uh, so that's on, that's on the research side what I want to uh, achieve. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I definitely learned a lot, and I hope the audience at home learned a lot, too. Um, so thank you for joining us. Please like and subscribe to our channel. If you want to learn more about adversary robustness, please check out the link below.